Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Manuel Endres as today's colloquium speaker. Um, Manuel is visiting us from Caltech. He did his uh, master's degree at the Johannes Gutenberg University at Mainz and his PhD at the LMU Munich and Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in the group of Emmanuel Bloch, um, where he did uh, really pioneering work developing uh, one of the first quantum gas microscopes as a tool for uh, probing strongly correlated many body systems um, with single atom resolved uh, imaging and addressing. He did a brief stint, um, a sort of one year postdoc uh, in the theory group of Ignacio Serac before uh, deciding he missed experimental physics and uh, going to Harvard uh, to the group of uh, Michel Lucan where he uh, developed a method of building from the bottom up arrays of individual atoms in optical tweezers as a, a starting point for quantum information processing applications. And um, since 2016, he's been at Caltech, where he's begun applying this technique um, to uh, state-of-the-art uh, optical clock technology and also uh, to realize record-breaking fidelity uh, of an entangling gate between neutral atoms. He's been uh, recognized for his work with numerous awards, the um, Otto Hahn Medal of the Max Planck Society for his PhD thesis, um, and more recently uh, with the Young Investigator Award from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and with the NSF uh, uh, Career Award. So we're very fortunate to have him here with us today and uh, to hear about his latest work. So thank you, Monica. Do you hear me? Okay, it's not too loud. It was a little loud earlier. Okay, so thanks for the really nice introduction and, and for inviting me and for hosting me. This has been a, a really wonderful visit so far and um, I hope to see more of you tomorrow in one-on-one -on -one meetings and maybe for dinner later. Um, so as Monica said, I'm, I'm Arnold Entres from Caltech and, and I'll talk about um, a set of techniques and, and results that we have been developing over the past uh, few years, five years maybe, uh, which concern basically trying to build up atomic systems from atom by atom scale, basically doing it from the ground up by trapping individual atoms and, and reshuffling them in a specific way. And one of the tools that we're using is tweezer arrays. It's not the only tool that, that you can use for that, but I will mainly be talking about that and then give you some introduction to that. Um, let me start pretty broad since it's a colloquium with uh, uh, some sort of the context of where we live. So what we do is experimental quantum science in, in the widest sense and there's many different uh, systems the traditional solid state systems. Uh, do you see that? Okay. Uh, super contacting qubits and so on, and cold atomic system, photonic system. So we work with cold atomic systems, uh, neutral atoms, and I'll briefly uh, mention ions uh, also in my talk. And I always find it fascinating that in this, in this context, um, despite this, this large array of, of different uh, experimental methods, uh, there's some sort of a set of common goals of what we want to do and a set of common challenges to a certain degree. And the goals, roughly speaking, for most of us is, uh, first of uh, we would like to build quantum computers that supply a set of gates to qubits to do uh, maybe tasks that are hard to calculate uh, classically. A second one, that's what I, I'm coming from for my PhD, is quantum simulation that is basically some sort of a specialized quantum computer that would solve a problem in the quantum anybody context, which is generically hard on a classical computer. A third one is quantum metrology, which is traditionally where AMO systems have their strengths. Um, and essentially is to use a quantum state or system for precision measurement that quantum state may, may or may not be entangled, but in principle it's a question of, of quantum control and then using them for measurements. And third of all, uh, we would like to uh, connect quantum systems via quantum networks, uh, either for improving precision measurements or for connecting quantum computers or uh, for all kinds of things. Anyway, so for these things, usually uh, we need large and highly controlled systems and at the same time we need uh, in many cases really to do something that is non-classical uh, entanglement across the full system and this is really where the challenging part is for most of these experiments and more specifically uh, I would like to point out uh, two key challenges. The first one is a technical one and essentially uh, it's, it's trying to reach scalable you know, very large and homogeneous systems and at the same time uh, trying to keep controllability at a single atom or single spin level. That's just technically extremely hard to do because you have to address everything, you need to know how to scale it up and still maintain resolution. Okay? Um, that's a technical challenge and, and that's basically an engineering question. There's a more physical challenge that I think is maybe the more severe one actually and that is that typically 
as I said, you need to grow entanglement in these systems. And, and if you don't have all-to-all -all interactions as in a cavity, which also at the same time restricts your states that you can reach, if you don't have all-to-all -all interactions, the time that you need to really build up entanglement in a system, it grows with system size. And so typically it grows with the linear dimension of the system. This is why there's an n to the 1d. And um, so this, the larger you make the system, the longer it takes, basically. And at the same time, if you really think about coherence in these systems, every individual spin or atom that you have in there can decohere individually. And if it's uncorrelated uh, decoherence, the coherence time actually decreases with one over n. Okay. If you really think about it, if you think about quantum jumps or something like this, you can basically uh, do a process that is decoherence, and this can happen for all of them. So if you really think about it, it multiplies up, actually. And then this is actually the fundamental challenge. So if you really try to scale something up and you try to make a very large coherent state or entangled state, it hits you twice. So first of all, it takes you longer to grow entanglement, and at the same time, you have higher decoherence rate. So this is actually why it's so hard to make entangled states that are larger than 20 qubits or something like that. And um, so these challenges are somewhere inherent to all platforms, and then specifically what I will talk about is how we can tackle some of these challenges uh, through new techniques for controlling individual atoms. And specifically then I'll switch in some part of the talk to alkaline earth atoms, which are two valence electron atoms. Um, and then before I move on, I should say, ask questions at any time, so the talk is maybe slightly shorter than I should say, and just say something during the talk, you know, I'm open for questions. Um, this is the outline, you know, so I will first introduce optical tweezers and a specific technique that we call atom by atom assembly, which is some sort of atomic Lego. Um, and then I will talk about a specific mechanism for creating interactions and entanglement in the system that's based on exciting atoms to highly lying root to x stakes. And then I'll switch to what we're doing at Caltech specifically, which is uh, trapping alkaline earth atoms in, in tweezer arrays. Uh, and then we developed a few techniques for narrow line cooling. I'll talk about how we image them. And then I'll show you some very recent results on how to achieve very uh, high fidelity Rydberg excitations in them. And I also talk a little bit about clocks, transition control, and how we can actually build uh, optical atomic clocks in these uh, arrays of individual atoms. Okay, so this is somewhat of the menu. Um, and I'll, I'll have a little bit of an outlook that zooms back to these more general questions that I have in the beginning. Um, before I move on, I'd like to acknowledge the team. So the work is done mainly by uh, these four guys in here. So Ivailo Matyarov is the lead uh, grad student, and Adam Shaw is a grad student. Jake Covey, who is a senior postdoc, who's applying for jobs these days. And then we also have a, a collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Lab at, at uh, Caltech which is a NASA lab, and actually they do quite a lot of atomic physics, which is somewhat surprising, and they have a unit that works on clocks. And we collaborated on all these clock results with them. So I should say that we're always looking for new members, so if you're interested in coming over for in any capacity, summer students, PhD, and so on, uh, just write me an email. And I should also thank the Harvard team. Uh, some, some of the data is still from Harvard in there. Okay, so this is the outline, and I'll start um, quite simple with optical tweezers on this atom by atom assembly, which is relatively easy to understand. So what's an optical tweezer? So optical tweezer is essentially a very tightly focused laser beam that you make with a high resolution objective or just a lens. And essentially it provides trapping for single atoms because these tweezers are extremely tight. And as these guys in, uh, in Paris showed uh, quite some years ago, if you do this right, you can trap exactly one atom or zero atoms. So there's some mechanism that prevents double occupation in these, in these traps. I won't go into details, it's light assisted so essentially when two atoms try to go into the tweezer, they collide and fly out. So this prevents you from ever trapping two atoms and the mechanism can be done with extremely high fidelity. And that's ex important for why this whole thing works in the all. So you basically end up with a system where you have either a single atom or, or no atom in the tweezer. And typically you load this tweezer from a magneto-optical trap. So there's a gas of cold atoms, and you just stick it in, and then you can trap a single atom. So that's a tweezer. So what we do uh, now is we generate large-scale tweezer arrays. Uh, and I think the first paper that I know which really did that is down here, some 2014, after a year, a year's missing, from Antoine Proves. They use spatial light modulators to do that. We do a little bit uh, of a different trick. So we use acousto-optical deflectors. So now what's an acousto-optical deflector? It's essentially an acousto-optical modulator that many of you loose in a lab. So it's a device that has a crystal inside and in this crystal you have a sound wave that is propagating and now if you send a laser beam through that sound wave it can get, basically get diffracted. And now the diffraction angle you can get uh, depends on the RF frequency that you send through this device. You can basically scan the diffraction angle with the RF frequency linearly. Okay, So this is if you only send in one RF 
waveform tool. Now the trick is here for this system that I'll show you is that we send in basically an RF frequency comp. So you send multiple frequencies in. So in the simplest case you have two frequencies and you get basically two diffracted beams out and each of the beams you can control with uh, one of the RF frequencies. Okay? And then in our case we send up to 100 RF frequencies in here and you can control 100 uh, individual beams and can steer their direction. Okay? So this is in 1D and then in 2D you can cross another AOD and make it basically copy the whole thing to a 2D array. Okay? So this is how we make these tweezer arrays and then you send this whole thing through an optical uh, high resolution platform and then this makes individually focused beams and you can have a lot of them. So, and a lot, I mean, you could have 10,000 of them pretty easily. So this is a picture of optical, uh, of the optical light field, not the atoms, but it's extremely homogeneous actually. And this is a 100 by 100 array of these tweezers. Okay, so that's not so hard. You can even make it in 3D. So the optically, this is not, not challenging. The challenging part is in the end um, twofold. So you need uh, enough laser power to actually trap atoms, so it has to be sufficiently deep as a trap. And the other one is you want uh, uh, basically a homogeneous filling in there. So generically, if you just stick these guys into a cloud of atoms, it's a stochastic loading process. You have a lot of holes in there. So, um, and I'll show you a technique in a second uh, in how to actually uh, reduce this, this entropy you have in the trap. So it's hard to scale it up and it's hard to fill it homogeneously, but it's not hard to make a lot of tweezers. So that's, that's a proof of principle. Okay, so, so how is it with this loading? So as I said, if you stick this tweezer into some cold gas and you try to trap atoms out of them, um, you typically have only zero or one in each tweezer. And this is basically now a video that I'll show you um, where you see repeated shots. So this is a tweezer array, I don't know, but like 10 by 10 approximately. And then, uh, so this would be a square array and you see already that only some of the traps are full. So whenever you see a white dot, your trap is filled. When you see nothing, you have zero. And then what you do is you load the gas, you stick the tweezers in, you let the gas disperse, you image the tweezer array and you see one of the shots and then you start from scratch. Okay, so you load it again and you see another picture. And this is this video. Okay, so you see this stuff. So it's completely stochastic, completely uncorrelated. They just fill in. And then what you find is that they're filled with about 50% probability with a single atom. Okay, you can... Uh, in, in this case, I need to remember a few micrometers. So in this case, it's a few micrometers. And you can go down to micron scale distance. So there's some limitations of how close you can get. It's a little complicated in the end. They, they start to interfere. That's the tricky part. But essentially, it's a micron scale. Okay. Um, so you can average this thing and you get these nice arrays, but usually uh, you have a stochastic feeling underlying these nice pictures that people often show. So now the generic problem is if I really want to build a quantum computer, a quantum simulator, I want to do something extremely controlled, I don't want to start with a, a stochastically filled array like that. So I want it to be compact. So on the probability, you really find something that's completely defect-free. It's, it's very low if you go to large atom traps. So it's 50% to the power of n, and if n is 20, it's already almost zero. Right? So there's nothing left. So the chances to see this thing completely filled is extremely low. So how do we really overcome that? And this is now where this atom by atom assembly technique comes in that uh, I developed with, with co-workers at Harvard a few years ago. Um, so the idea is the following. So you load uh, tweezers from a magneto-optical trap, as I said, and you make a large array, and I showed you how to make the arrays. And then you see that some of these atoms, uh, some of the tweezers are filled and some of them are empty. And if you have a very good imaging system, you can identify this in a single imaging step with high fidelity. And then you can say, okay, since I have the control over these RF waveforms, I can just switch off RF tones for the ones that are empty. Okay, and then obviously it's everything is filled, but there's still uh, now uh, basically uh, entropy in the position of the trap. So you just have to remove that entropy. So you basically just reshuffle everything into a compact array. So that's the idea. So you basically, and you do that by changing the RF frequency of each of these beams. So you can move them around. So it boils down to an exercise in RF friction, frequency generation and high fidelity imaging. So that's the idea. And here's some sort of a before and after picture. So this is an array in 1D now. Uh, with 100 tweezers and about 50 of them are filled and you always see a picture uh, before that rearrangement step and a picture after the rearrangement step and this is how it looks like. So it's this and we compactify in this case to the left. So you see it works in almost all cases. You get this very nice uh, filled arrays. So there's a single shot pictures. Um, 
And you can also vary the geometry because you have control over all these RF frequencies. You can decide where to put the tweezers in the final image. So you can do clusters of two or clusters of 10. And I'll come back to this. You can basically draw stuff with these things. And there's some sort of success probability. I'll come back to this in a second. But this is essentially how it works. So this is atom by atom assembly. So questions for that before we move on? OK, just you know, throw out questions. Feel free. Um, OK, so this was in about 2016, um, where we published a paper back to back with Antoine Probe's group in Paris. They have a, a slightly different scheme that I don't want to explain in detail. They can do a scheme in 2D. Um, there's a few more groups who do this. There's a group in Korea. Uh, and then Dave Weiss has a, yet another scheme that works in optical lattices, which is somewhat of a similar idea. And there's a few others, and we do it at Caltech now, as I'll show you later. Um, so this has developed in some sort of its own subfield by now, and it's used in a few different contexts. So uh, maybe the bottom line of this is that you can uh, arrange defect-free arrays of about 50 atoms at the moment in 1D, 2D, and to a certain degree in 3D. The atomic distance is adjustable down to a micrometer, up to 100 micrometers, whatever you want. And the uh, geometry is flexible in each arrangement. So I can just basically program a different geometry for each shot that I want to do, for each experimental repetition. And uh, one thing that's also important that somehow not always mention is that the repetition rate of these experiments is much higher than a traditional cold atom experiment. So a traditional cold atom experiment, yeah. So you, you described the rearrangement in 1D. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, there's m many different schemes for 2D actually. So what they do in this case is they have two lattices, one that's fixed. So they have uh, a basically a base lattice and a sorting uh, tweezer. So in their case, they just take one lattice and they trap atoms in there. And then they take one tweezer which just moves one atom at a time until it's compact. And this f works surprisingly well. There's a new scheme where you have one base lattice and then you have multiple tweezers. It's like a machine and it just it does everything in parallel. That's better, but just the original one is just one tweezer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is up here. So much faster repetition rate. So if you do a traditional cold atom experiment, usually involves an evaporative cooling step, which is very lengthy. And this does not have an evaporative cooling step to get very uh, controlled arrays. And um, so typically, the repetition rate of these experiments is about 100 milliseconds. Also, you need very small magneto-optical traps only, because you only have to pick out an atom or 10 or 50 or something like that. So this makes experimenting uh, with them easier. Um, in any case, there are some limits to that. So it's not some sort of uh, a magic thing, you know. So it's the same limitation that you had before. So the, the probability of success to have nothing, no hole, is exponentially small. You know, it's p to the n, with your success probability to place one atom somewhere, basically. So you have some single atom transport probability and imaging probability and so on. And uh, if you can see in this scaling, it's p to the n, that if you really want to scale this up to a thousand atoms, you have to have a very high fidelity for each single atom to move them around and position them, and you're not allowed to lose them. Right? So if you really want to avoid holes, it's extremely hard. Okay? And this is also, to a certain degree, why there's only 50 atoms. And at the same time, you need a large number of traps, so it's a laser power limitation. Okay, so this tells you something about scalability. Okay, questions? Good. I'll come back to this actually. We see seven minutes now. Yes, it's very long. So we can do that. Yeah. Uh, under cooling. So if you don't cool, they go out quite quick. But under cooling, it's seven minutes. Yeah. Uh, okay. More questions? Switch gears. Okay, good. Uh, so the point is. Now you have basically some sort of an initial array, but they don't interact. So it's neutral atoms, and at a micron scale, they basically the interaction energy is basically zero. Uh, so the question is, how do you make them interacting in this case? So you could bring atoms very close together, and they could start tunneling between tweezers, and some people are working on this. Or uh, you could work on long-range interactions, So that's actually what we are doing. So and there's different types of long-range interactions. One is dipole-dipole interactions of some sort, and we use Rydberg states. I'll explain this in a second. So you could have molecules with a permanent and dipole moment, for example. And uh, another way is to use photon-mediated interactions, for example, in cavities, which is something that Monica is pursuing, of course, here. And also, you can combine these techniques with tweezers, I think. And people have done it, for example, with photonic crystals. So I'll talk in detail about Rydberg interactions. And this is a particularly fruitful marriage between uh, Rydberg excitations and then these tweezer arrays for various reasons that I'll explain. 
Okay, so Rydberg expectations and its limits. So how does this work? So what's a Rydberg atom to start with? So uh, norm normally you're used to atoms in its ground state or close to ground state. So for example, this is rubidium in its absolute ground state and then the size of the electronic wave function is quite small, as you all know. And then once you excite these guys to very high quantum numbers, and that's what we call a Rydberg atom, um, Basically, the electronic wave function gets very large, and it's surprisingly large. The first time I thought about this, I found this a very large number. 200 nanometers is ginormous, right? And this essentially explains all the properties of this in a hand wavy way. So in particular, uh, you get an extremely strong interaction between atoms. That's of van der Waals in type. So van der Waals interaction are induced dipole interactions. That means there's no permanent dipole moment, but there's fluctuating dipole moments in a way. And the reason why they are so strong, it has to do with the fact that the electronic orbit is so large. So essentially, these electrons, they can fumble around very easily. You can move them very easily. So there's an, a large polarizability, essentially. And then because these electrons move around a little bit, you have induced dipole-dipole interactions, and they typically scale with this 1 over R6. So one thing that is then surprising is that it scales so extremely with the quantum number. So it's n to the 11. So because of this n to the 11 scaling, uh, you can have uh, basically insane interaction energies on atomic physics scales at very large distances. If you go to two microns, which is a typical scale in these tweezer arrays, you can have 14 gigahertz interaction, which is extremely strong. And that's something we utilize in these applications in quantum computing and simulations, as I will show you in a second. Uh, so this is the important part. So the interaction range or the strengths of interactions that you can have on typical atomic distances in these tweezer arrays uh, can, be, can be very high. So that's the trick of this Rydberg, guys. Okay. So how does this look like in practice? So in practice, you have this kind of arrays. And now um, you, you drive basically all atoms. So that's the simplest case. We drive all atoms simultaneously to a Rydberg state. And in a simplified fashion, you can describe this as a two-level system, where you have a ground state and a Rydberg state. So this ground state is supposed to be a rubidium atom or something like this, close to the ground state. And then you assume the ground state is non-interacting, but the Rydberg state can be extremely strongly interacting. And what's the Hamiltonian for such an array? So I assume everything is assembled, everything is disorder-free. It looks like that. In a rotating frame, so there's a typical atomic physics, you basically have a spin operator that describes the drive, so it's a sigma 6x operator in this basis. Uh, then you have a detuning term that just depends on how far you detune from resonance here, and then there's this interaction term in here. And this interaction term, again, then only acts on the Rydberg state, so this is a projector on the Rydberg up here. So in the ground state, it does not interact. So it's essentially the Hamiltonian in a nutshell. And this gives you a strongly interacting many-body system just right from the scratch at these atomic distances. And now the cool thing with these arrays is that you can basically tune the interaction term at will by changing the spacing. And because it's 1 over 6 interaction, you can change it over many orders of magnitude by just programming in a different pattern. So that's the trick. And now the question is in the end, so how coherent is all of that and what kind of many-body physics can you see? And also, can you basically use this, this type of Hamiltonian as an engineering tool for quantum computing or for quantum optimization and these kind of tasks? And um, I won't say too much about it. I will briefly go about some kind of generic features just to, to kind of uh, poke your interest. So if you just look at the ground states, the many-body ground states of this Hamiltonian, in 1D on the simplest possible geometry, it's already extremely complex. So there's multiple ordered phases. They are called Rydberg crystals. So if you can basically drive systems into crystalline phases, I won't go into details. And um, and there's multiple types of crystalline phases, there's multiple types of quantum phase transitions involved, and then if you think more about it, you will find that there's uh, lines that are close to integrability, there's conformal field theories, all kinds of things going on, just in the simplest 1D case. So my point is, um, this richness they comes basically from an interplay of quantum effects, so it's a strongly interacting quantum systems. You have long-range interactions, and these long-range interactions drive these different types of crystalline phases, and you have a strange, you can put it on different types of geometry. And this, this really gives to extremely uh, rise to extremely rich physics. So now the ground state physics is understood somewhat in 1D, but actually even this phase diagram is not completely understood. In 2D, not much is known actually, it's quite complicated. And then if you really think about non-equilibrium dynamics, there's, it's, it's an extremely rich playground to study questions of many-body non-equilibrium dynamics. And I don't want to go into details, there's things that have to do with quantum chaos, you could study integrability and these kind of things. And then more generically, if you think of systems where you have more control and, and you do single site addressing, you can use these things for some sort of quantum engineering in a way. So there's mechanisms, for example, to engineer uh, GHG states and so on. And I don't want to go into details of this. My point is it's a rich playground for quantum science in general. 
uh, specifically for quantum simulation and if you think forward for quantum information and I will show you some things for metrology in the end. But um, uh, there's some good experimental progress but I think we really have only seen the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with it. So it's really kind of really early, early stages. We have worked with this now for essentially three years or so, that's it. So there's a lot to be done. And um, the question is also a little bit what are the limits and, and, and where does it go? And I want to come back uh, in, a, in a quick interlude to uh, the slide I had in the beginning about what are actually the challenges in this, in this uh, emerging quantum science field. And one is, of course, I want to do something where I can beat a classical computer one way or another. That's what everyone's trying to do. And one simple test case here is, can I perform, can I perform some sort of quantum dynamics experiment or quantum simulation experiment that could beat at least classical numerics? state-of-the-art classical numerics. And you can start to ask this question and then go through some test cases and see what happens under realistic conditions. And that's something I'll briefly go through and, and I'll tell you why this is so hard. So the case study that we did numerically is a quantum chaotic dynamics in the 2D Rydberg Hamiltonian. So 2D is very little known, but what you know is that for some generic choice of parameters, the system is chaotic. And, and you want a chaotic Hamiltonian for a task like this because you want to avoid any kind of analytical or integrable description. So you want to be far away from any point that you could describe per hand. So this you want to exclude. And then in this quantum chaotic regime, you can basically just run many body dynamics in that system and see how entanglement spreads in the system. So you start with an initial product state of spins and you try to see how correlations basically build up and how fast this goes. So you can look at basically entanglement as a function of time, as a function of subsystem size. And then what you see, it basically grows. And but at the same time, uh, what we did in this numerics, we actually ran it with dissipation. So we ran it with decoherence mechanisms on the top. So we, for example, included here just the base spontaneous emission of these Rydberg states as the simplest possible case. So, and then you will see, for example, uh, that you have some sort of a, a decoherence probability. So this is the probability that the system observes a single jump basically from an excited state to a ground state by spontaneous emission. Okay. And then you can ask the following question. Um, what's the probability to have uh, no jump, so this is this, this orange time, uh, time, at some time where the system has basically uh, grown maximally in its entanglement. So you try to spread entanglement in the system across the full system time scale, and you ask yourself, what's the probability to have no decoherence event? So it's the probability that you coherently basically thermalize the whole system and spread entanglement throughout. And then asking why no jump, it's, it's basically some sort of a subsector of the dynamics where, where you have no decoherence event. It's, it's a hard question, it's a tough for experiment, but in the end, if you run a quantum computation without error correction, that's what you have to do, for example. And this tells you why hard it is. So what you see here is that, um, so the time that you need for this entanglement, it, it grows basically with the subsystem size or generically close with the system size. And then we went into details and you see the following scaling. So for example, you see what I told you initially that this decoherence rate that you have and it's trivial, in this case scales with n. Um, and then you can actually ask yourself how long does it take to entangle the full system and you see that it scales with n to the 1d, that's the linear size, so it's a 1d system, it's linear in the system size, if it's 2d it's square root in the system size, if it's 3d it's 3 half in the system size. It's just basically some sort of a linear spreading. And if, if you put these things together you come up with this some sort of generic law, so the probability for no decoherence event at the entangling time is this generic law. So it's exponentially suppressed again and then you see some some sort of prefactor that have to do with the decoherence rate and the energy scale you have in your Hamiltonian, and then there's a geometric factor. So what you see is that you have to improve, and that's trivial in a sense, the decoherence rate compared to the energy scale in your, in your Hamiltonian, just have to be faster. But you see that these two factors combine. So there's the n and the 1 nd, and they combine to this n 1 plus 1 d. So this is what I mentioned in the beginning. It kind of hits you twice. So it's extremely hard to do that, and you can run through the numbers. And what you see is that in pretty much any system, not just Rydberg systems, the uh, jump probability is about 50% for 20 qubits, you know, in 1D or 2D. Like maybe Google guys are slightly better, but not much better. So that's about it. And this, this is extremely challenging and it has to do with these numbers. So these numbers have to be extremely good, you know. And the question is uh, then specifically in the context of this Rydberg uh, simulations and Rydbergs this is all similar, it's 20 qubits, maybe slightly, slightly larger, but that's, that's it. So what are really the limits now, and how can I go forward to really something fundamentally different? So what are the limits? Um, so the limits to start with, as I mentioned, uh, 
I don't know why this goes on so fast. So the, first of all, these Rydberg states, they have a finite lifetime, and this lifetime is 100 microseconds. You have to be much faster than that. Not just a factor of two, but a factor of 100 if you want to entangle 100 qubits, something like that. Then typically in, in alkali atoms, and that's all the results that have people have been doing, it's a two-photon transition. So you have to go via an intermediate state, and this intermediate state gives you an additional decay time of about 50 microseconds. And so typically you have 50 microseconds time, that's all you have. And additionally, a finite temperature and laser noise, this, this basically all adds up in some sort of an effective coherence time for these systems. Um, there's something that's not often said is that these experiments when people show results, they're actually done in free flight. So generically, these ripback states are extremely strongly anti-trapped in the tweezers. So what you do is you cool atoms in the tweezers, and then before you switch off these ripback lasers to induce these ripback dynamics, you actually switch off the laser, uh, the, the trap quickly. You switch it off, and then uh, as I will show you in a second, the time scale for driving this Rydberg excitation is extremely fast compared to motional time scale. So these atoms, they only move a very tiny bit. And if that motion is small compared to the dynamics, then you can basically do everything in, in free fall. But the point is that this free fall doesn't last forever. So eventually these atoms, they drift too far and you cannot trap them anymore afterwards. So you have about 10 microseconds and this sets a maximum time scale that you have for these experiments. And at the same time, a limiting factor is then how fast you can do this. And this basically depends on the laser power you have in this Rydberg beam. And this gives you around a few megahertz. So basically you have to compare this 10 microseconds to this time scale. This is all you can do in a way. This, this gives you a fundamental limit. And then system size wise, ideally it would like be large, so we have 50 atoms, and it's, you know, again limited by this survival probabilities I talked about. And then another limit is actually if you really want to do many body physics, you have to look at many body observables, and then in the end you run into a detection limit. So the detection fidelity for these Rydberg states is about 96%, roughly speaking. Okay. And um, so this is the kind of state of the art at the moment for, for Rydberg atoms. And then I'll tell you in a second what we do differently now. Do you have any questions about Rydberg? It's a little fast. Yeah. So the the two states that you're talking about, those are in the intermediate states, or um, um, when you have yeah. your, your state on a site and those are interacting, those are not in the Rydberg state, or are they? Yeah. So that's different schemes. That's a good question. So typically, um, so this ground state is really some sort of absolute ground state of the atom, and then. In, in, in alkali atoms, there's an intermediate state that you kind of adiabatically eliminate by going off resonant, and then you have this Rydberg state. So this Hamiltonian I wrote down, for example, is in the basis of this ground state and the Rydberg state, and this guy is somehow neglected. That's what you do. Now, and this is the generic setting, and I'll maybe come back to this. This is the generic setting how you would do this many body quantum simulation experiments. It's usually written in this type of system. And more generally, it's usually a three-level system. I'll come back to this. Often you use two ground states that are much more long-lived, so 100 microseconds, not very long. So you have two hyperfine ground states, and I'll come back to optical ground states. But you have two hyperfine ground states that are live, they live for hours, for example. And that what, if you say you want to do a quantum gate, as an example, what you want to do is entangle the hyperfine ground states via some intermediate step of mediating entanglement via this other Hamiltonian. I'm just reducing the talk slightly to this quantum simulation idea. Yeah. So, but this is so far all in this ground to Rydberg basis. And I should say I'm focusing on that because in, in cold atoms, we know how to control hyperfine levels extremely well. You can do this with extreme high fidelity. The limiting factor, for example, for Rydberg gate, and I'll come back to this, has been the, the fidelity with which you can do these Rydberg operations. So how well can I actually drive this Rydberg transition? And how well can I generate entanglement on this Rydberg transition? This has been a limiting factor by far. So that's why I focus on that part. Questions? Okay, then let me move on. So what we do at Caltech is now uh, ask, ask this kind of question. So can we improve on, on these limits by using different types of atoms? So maybe I can play atomic physics tricks to really eliminate some of these, some of these ideas. And also when I use a different type of atom, maybe I have ideas for really qualitatively different applications. And specifically, uh, we just went one, one column up in a, in, a, in a periodic table. So usually the experiments are done with alkali atoms so far, and we use alkaline earth atoms. So what are alkaline earth atoms? Atoms with two valence electrons, 
and they have a very specific uh, le level structure that basically consists of, of singlet and triplet uh, transitions and these triplet transitions can be extremely narrow because they're dipole forbidden usually. And then this is the specific case of strontium where you here have extremely narrow transition of 7 kilohertz compared to a standard transition in alkali which is more 6 megahertz. And then you have even narrower transition, these are the so-called clock transitions which have extremely long lifetime and extreme low line width. And typically these atoms are used now in in, in optical lattice clocks and then basically people try to stabilize lasers to these optical transitions and, and you have some of the pioneers of this of course here in the audience. And um, generically people in the past 10 years or so have, have really reached a tremendous amount of control of these atoms, of these narrow line lasers and so on. There's been extreme amount of progress and we are leveraging some of this progress now. So what we want to do is really um, use this peculiar level structure of narrow transitions and even having this a very long-lived metastable states for purposes uh, uh, in, in quantum simulation and, and computing uh, and, and really uh, use, use them combined with these tweezer techniques. So what we want to do is really control arrays of individual alkaline earth atoms and control them atom by atom but at the same time also with very high spectral frequency control and see what we can do with that. That was somehow the premise of what we set out to do. Um, and I'll walk you through some of the results that we have along these lines and I'll, I'll go relatively brief on each of them. Uh, I'll first show you how we can do narrow line uh, cooling, optical cooling uh, in these tweezers and then I'll show you how we use this for high fidelity imaging and then I'll briefly go come back to Rydberg and how we improve on some of these Rydberg fidelities now and then very, in the very end I'll show you uh, how we can control this clock transition and how we can build a clock out of it. So, Let's go fast, you know, but just interrupt me. I'll skip some stuff in the end. Um, okay, so for the experts, this is all with strontium-88. Okay. Okay, so first narrow line cooling. Um, so this was one of the reasons why I originally wanted to work with strontium. So strontium has this very narrow 7 kilohertz transition. And uh, if you think about what happens in a trap, so these atoms are in a trap, and it's basically at the bottom of the trap, you can describe this as a harmonic oscillator. So these atoms, they just wobble around down here. And then if this is a nice trap, it basically has an harmonic oscillator motional spectrum. And then if you use the right wavelengths, the excited state here is trapped with the same, uh, with the same trap. Okay. And now if this... Uh, if the line width of your optical transition is narrower than the motional trap spacing here, you can basically address these, these levels individually. And we are actually in that, in that regime. So for us, the spacing of these motional levels is around 100 kilohertz or higher, and the optical transition uh, line width is 7 kilohertz. So you're basically essentially in a standard sideband cooling regime. So what you can do is you can basically take atoms, say that n equals 1 motional state, drive them to n equals 0, and then they preferably uh, decay down to n equals 0. So if you apply this correctly, you can basically do red sideband cooling. And this is a typical sideband cooling uh, spectrum that you get if you do this right. And we can cool basically uh, very close to the ground state with the sideband cooling. Um, so this is one thing and this is kind of new in a sense. You can do single atom direct uh, sideband cooling basically here. Another thing that we discovered, this was somewhat unexpected, so we always thought that you have to be in this what's called a magic trapping condition, which is that the ground and excited state have the same trapping potential. Um, it turns out if the excited state has a, a vastly different trapping potential, you run into a regime that's a, a textbook, what's called Sisyphus cooling regime. And what happens in here is that um, because the line width here is so narrow compared to all the energy scales of this trap, so you have to imagine, so this is a 7 kilohertz line width and that, that thing is basically 10 megahertz deep or something like this, or megahertz is deep. So that means that in a, in a classical picture what you can do if these uh, the ground and the excited states have different trapping potentials, you can create a local resonance in space. So I can tune this laser and basically on a very narrow shell in the trap, I can scan through the trap and I can tell you where the atom gets excited with extreme precision because it's 7 kilohertz versus megahertz. So I can basically, on some sort of energy shell, I can excite atoms. And if you're clever about that, you can now, in this specific configuration, tune this such that you only excite at the very bottom of the trap. And what happens now if you have an atom oscillating in here, it will roll down and then only get excited here and then roll up and then emit at some random point, at some kind of classical turning point. But that turning point will be further out. And then the emission process gets down and you roll down. But if you now compare what happens in this whole process, you're actually losing energy because you roll up here and then you roll down only with here. So you gain this kind of potential energy difference. And it's a classic example of, of Sisyphus cooling, what's called Sisyphus cooling. Uh, 
because you kind of try to repeat it, you go up and go down. So, and we see basically the Sisyphus cooling on a single atom level in these tweezers now. I don't want to show the results, but we have very clear evidence that this is happening. And the nice part, um, is that this is extremely robust. So we use actually this type of Sisyphus schooling scheme for almost everything that we do now. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we do that, that's a little bit for the laser cooling experts, you only need one beam. So normally if you do sideband cooling, you have to go from all three sides. Or if you do laser cooling, usually you have to go from all three sides. And this happens to cool in all three directions with only one beam. And that's because all the recoil comes from the trap. And it's extremely practical for cooling and during imaging because you don't get photons into your camera. It's a bit of a side note. Okay, so it's extremely uh, robust. And also with the Sisyphus, we see in practice, we get extremely close to the ground state. It's a bit of a tricky question to answer, but it's actually true. So it's very robust, and you get close to the ground state with only one beam. So it's extremely simple experimentally. And it's important in the end to be so cold for root coherence. I'll come back to this imaging fidelity and all these things. So this is how we cool. Okay, so cooling is important. How do we image? So what we do is basically we keep on cooling on this one transition, trying to keep the atoms cold, and then we scatter photons on another transition that heat them a little bit, and then we balance things out such that they stay in some equilibrium, and we essentially just collect the photons from this 30 megahertz line. This is the blue line. And the imaging setup is super simple. You have one cooling beam, one excitation beam, and then you just image on a camera with a high resolution uh, objective. And then this is what you see. So you see this is a tweezer array, and this is now uh, strontium-88 atoms, this is a single shot, this is average, so see the single shots look very, very clean. And if you go into details, uh, you can look at this photon counting statistics, that's the way this is normally done. So what you do is you basically make a box around one of these spots here, and then you count basically in this box how many EMCCD counts you see on your camera in each shot, and you make a histogram out of this, okay. And then you see two peaks here, um, of this count distribution. One is down here at zero and one is up here. And if you go, would go up higher, you wouldn't see anything else. And these two peaks correspond to cases where you have no atom and one atom. And this is how you basically discriminate these things in experiment. You basically put a threshold here and I say, if you see more counts, it's one atom. If you see no counts, it's a single atom. And then the key for the single atom imaging is you have uh, histograms like this where this is extremely well separated, okay? And this is an extremely well separated case and then you can really figure out what's the fidelity you have with which you can distinguish an empty from a full trap. And this fidelity turns out to be four nines and upwards for us and we can go through the mass, it's extremely high. And another important uh, factor is the survival probability. So you can distinguish an empty from a full trap but if I have a full trap, I also want to have the trap to be full the next time I image or want to do something with it. So it's a survival probability and this turns out to be also so three nines and upwards. And these numbers are important for uh, basically debugging systems, but they're also important in this rearrangement scheme. So because if you take a first image and you lose an atom, the probability to have a hole later on is again the same probability to the power of n. So you have to have these high fidelities to go to thousands of atoms. You actually need three nines upwards to go to a thousand atoms. And um, as I said, the earlier, so we have extremely long lifetimes, and this is the key to reach these fidelities. So the lifetime in a tweezer now is seven minutes, so it's more uh, almost like an iron trap experiment at this stage. So this is really, really what we, what we reached. And to our knowledge, these are the best values in terms of detection fidelity and survival probability that have been demonstrated for neutral atoms in general. And again, it's important for a large-scale assembly, so you could go to a thousand basically now and debugging high-fidelity quantum operations. Okay, questions about that? You good? Okay, so we basically can image these guys with high fidelity and, and, and they stay there. That's the point. Okay, a quick interlude. So we figured out this assembly scheme also for strontium. I don't want to say too much. So we can do this with strontium and write nice pictures. Um, it's essentially the same with a slightly different algorithm that we'll, we'll publish essentially at some point. And I'll use this in a second for these Rydberg uh, results. So we can image them and we can put the assembly on top now with alkaline earth atoms. So we can do all of that. Um, Okay, let me come back to Rydberg. So I told you a little bit about Rydberg and quantum simulation and so on and about a few, a few limits that we have in there. And um, so a key feature that we use now in, in alkaline earth is we make use of this metastable state. So this is the level structure. This is the absolute ground state. So you start atoms in here and then you transfer them somehow up here and I'll show in a second how. 
And we use this basically as a new ground state. So this thing lives for 100 seconds, you forget about this guy for a second, and then you can go with a single photon excitation to an s back state. Normally you cannot do that because of dipole selection rules, but here you can, so you park them here and then you go up and this basically replaces this two photon scheme. So it's a stepwise two photon scheme in instead of a fatty tuned two photon scheme. And it has a lot of advantages, you can get very high Rabi frequencies, so the dipole matrix element is high, you don't have to go via this two photon thing. Um, the atoms are very cold in our case because we use this sideband cooling and we have new detection scheme I'll show in a second and the Rydberg states actually in principle can be trapped via the polarizability of the ion core. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so we did that very recently, so we transferred the atoms up here and they shine in this laser and then we basically look at just Rabi oscillations between the ground and Rydberg state, so delta is zero in this case, it's on resonance, and we place the atoms using atom by atom assembly so far away that the interaction between the Rydberg states doesn't matter to start with. So that's another advantage, I can just basically dial in a system configuration where it's completely non-interacting just to debug everything. So this is what we do here. And this is a typical Rabi oscillations that you see. So it's basically a textbook Rabi oscillation between this ground and Rydberg state. So you see, first of all, there's almost no decay on the level of a uh, two pi, and then you see this goes up really, it's a really full contrast one oscillation. And this is not corrected for any kind of detection efficiency or anything, this is bare data, so we didn't do anything. And um, so first of all, this is the first Rabi oscillation with single alkaline earth on these Rydberg levels. And then one thing is the trap, the Rabi frequencies that we can reach are almost an order of magnitude higher than in, in alkaline earth. That's important for this entanglement spreading questions. And then the fidelities that we reach is basically, if you ask the question, what's the fidelity to do a pi or two pi pulse, it's about 99.5. And this is with correct, not correcting for preparation and detection errors. And this is by far a record for, for Rydberg atoms, I have to say. Usually they don't go completely up here. So this is not just doing it with a new platform, but we also in the first shot within doing this for four months or five months uh, have, have new fidelity records and detection efficiency records. And I'll show you how the detection works in a second. So this is a non-interacting case. Questions about that? Okay, good. Um, you can do it for longer time, I will skip over this for a second. So we can drive it for longer times and see up to 40 to 50 oscillations, which is also a record in terms of long-term coherence. Now the interacting case is the, is the really uh, uh, interesting one. So we can use now this assembly scheme to basically uh, pr prepare pairs of atoms, where each pair doesn't interact with another pair, but within the pair they are so close that this interaction energy is really the dominating energy scale. And then basically what you expect is some sort of a mini doublet system that oscillates and you have a bunch of copies of them just to get more statistics, essentially. And the physics is quite, quite simple. So you have two atoms in a ground state, so there's four levels, ground, ground, ground R, RG, RR. And if you're far away, you should basically drive this Rabi oscillation I showed you, but if you put them really close by, such that this Rydberg interaction up here is extremely strong, the second process of going to RR is completely forbidden. So if you're really in that regime, what happens is effectively, if you think about it a little longer, is that you drive an oscillation from both atoms in a ground state only into this manifold, and because of the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, you couple only to one symmetrized state here. So it's actually GR plus RG with some phase that you don't know to start, which is actually arbitrary. So essentially what you expect in this blockade regime um, is a Rabi oscillation between this state and this state. And this is also what we observe in the data. Uh, so this is a different type of probability. It's essentially the probability um, to be either in GG or in RR. Uh, and this probability goes from one to really extremely close to zero to one to extremely close to zero. And so this is an oscillation between these two states. And then more precisely, we developed a technique to, to figure out the entanglement fidelity that you have. So essentially at this point where you drive a pi pulse, you expect to be in this state and you can ask yourself, what's the fidelity that I have for reaching this Bell state essentially? And the Bell state fidelity, uh, uh, is about 98% if you don't correct for preparation and measurement. If you correct for preparation and measurement, it's 99.5. And this is also, to my knowledge, a record for neutral atoms, actually, by far. It used to be 97 if you correct for uh, detection and preparation errors, and 94 if it's uncorrected. So we really make it quite, quite a big jump now. And this 99.5 is actually as good, for example, as superconducting qubits are in a gate. I should say there's not a full gate yet, so you have to do more steps, but this used to be by far the limiting factor for a gate. So if you put that thing together with other techniques for gates, I think you can reach these numbers in a two qubit gate. Uh, another thing we did is we did the same thing in traps, so this is all in free flight. This is for experts. We 
you don't have to switch off the trap and it still works with high fidelity. And that's actually important if you want to build a computer, you don't want to switch your traps on and off all the time. It's not good for you. Okay, so this also works and you can do it long term. And that's actually one of the results that I found the most surprising that it works like this. You can drive this blockaded oscillations for 60 oscillations. So this is a 60 times you go into an entangled state and back. And this is actually, I found it surprising that it works that well. Okay, good. Uh, how much, how am I time, Monica? Almost done. Five more minutes? Okay, so. Um, let me explain this because I find it interesting. So how do we actually detect if we are in a rootback state or not? So normally what people do is they they basically, okay, they drive, say, this Rabi oscillation and say in a 50-50 super, superposition and then you want to distinguish Rydberg from ground state. What you do is you switch these tweezers back on to very high depth and then everything that's in a Rydberg state is extremely anti-trapped and flies out of the trap. And then you basically just catch the ground state atoms and image them. So the, it's basically destructive in a way such that Rydberg atoms are very quickly lost. And this, this basically uh, is the detection scheme and that's not very high fidelity because on the time scale that the atoms escape from this tweezer, they can decay back to the ground state. And if you're not fast enough, uh, you get a detection infidelity from atoms that decay back down before you like, basically image them. Now what we do is actually quite different. So we use an outdoor ionization schemes and for this, the idea is that we convert Rydberg's very quickly to ions and I'll show you in a second how this works and this is extremely fast and then we image remaining ground state atoms and essentially the ions do something that we don't understand it doesn't matter but the ions don't appear in the picture because they completely have completely different level structure that we don't image anymore that's the idea so it's a loss based auto ionization scheme so how does it work so essentially the object that I showed you the whole time that does this Rabi oscillation in a nutshell is a it's a two valence electron atom where you shoot one electron into a very high lying orbit, but you have a core ion left. So it's an ion with a tightly bound uh, electron. So this is a strontium plus ion down here. And um, so this is the Rydberg state. And then what you can do is you can basically excite this core ion on a standard D1 or D2 line. You just shoot this electron one, one higher and then there's an electron-electron collision such that one electron can fall out and the other guy falls back. So this is a standard outer ionization process in a nutshell. And we use this and it's extremely fast. That's the thing. And then our detection efficiency that we can get with this is also extremely high. So we have a lower bound just for measuring it, which is three nines upwards and it's an upper bound in terms of comparing time scales which is some sort of an ultimate limit, but also not fully ultimate, which is some sort of four nines upwards. So you can have extremely high detection efficiency for these Rydberg states. And that's another big factor that we gained now with these alkaline earth atoms. Okay, so this is the detection scheme. Now you can ask a stupid question. So what happens with the iron? You know, is this iron, is this still there or not? And um, so first of all, this process, as far as we understand it, almost doesn't heat the atom because the electron is very light, just goes out. And then the iron basically doesn't get much recoil. So it should be not, perturb much. And on the same, at the same time, so this iron core still has optical transitions. And if you choose the right trapping wavelengths, originally the iron will also still be trapped. So we think actually that these ions are still there up to stray magnetic fields. So if you make this tweezers deep enough and you start with a ground state cooled neutral atom and you do this process correctly, I think you could still have a ground state cooled iron in the tweezer automatically. Something we haven't demonstrated, but generically should be possible. And it just gives you a new route, basically, to iron physics in a way, if you want to. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have electrodes in our system. Otherwise, we would have tried that already. I think our stray fields are too high. But if you build an experiment, this, this you will see it for sure. So this is a new way to ions. So that's why I wanted to really talk about this originally. Anyway, so let me hurry up. Um, so I showed you, uh, so I basically claimed that we transfer atoms from the ground state to this metastable state, and you have to do this via a, a, a narrow transition, which is this clock transition. And we can drive this transition and in a strong magnetic field uh, with relatively high Rabi frequency and then achieve basically uh, pi transfer efficiency about 9999, and then we have some additional optical pumping. This is how we go there. And, and, and we have used this in these Rydberg experiments only as a preparation step, but you can ask a different question. So you can ask what's the minimal line width that you can actually achieve in a tweezer. And then a generic optical clock is basically just a stabilizing a laser system to this transition. So can you use these tweezer arrays instead of an optical lattice to build a clock? Okay, this is one slide I'll show you in a second. So we basically did that. You shine in a clock laser, you probe, uh, this transition, you use the single atom readout that you have and you basically feedback 
uh, to this clock laser system. And we did that, so you can basically do a double probing sequence to get an error signal and then just do that. So we demonstrated this in this paper. There's a parallel paper by the Chila group. They showed basically spectroscopy with extremely coherence, extreme long coherence, and we really showed uh, basically a stabilized clock system and, and really using single atom readout in detail. So the point is, this is average signal, but now what is really exciting about this is that you can probe uh, this, this two-level system here with basically hertz level or sub-hertz level precision, but I have the single atom readout and control on top. So in particular, for example, we can look at error signals that are really hertz level and then atom resolve. So there's 81 atoms in a tweezer and you see an error signal that's hertz level resolved for all of them. And you can resolve frequency differences like subhertz, 100, 100 millihertz level. And um, so we played with all this kind of stuff in this paper and details. You can do all kind of shenanigans with it. But uh, one thing I want to say is that this is some sort of a, a marriage of precision measurement and single atom control. And not just one atom, but like 80 atoms and in principle thousands of atoms. And I think this is the one of the main messages of this talk, that I think this will happen more and more. So I think there will be a new generation of experiments at my prediction where you see this, not just for clocks, but also for EDM measurements and these kind of things, because these tweezers and these techniques, in principle, they work for almost anything. And it works even for stuff that you cannot even trap in a magneto-optical trap, I think, actually. So this is, I think, an extremely powerful technique where you do single atom trapping and then precision measurement on top. And that's the main bottom line. So in, in terms of clocks, what we did, it's somewhere of a kind of hybrid between an iron clock and an optical lattice clock in terms of capabilities. Okay. All right. And these are the two schemes I showed you. So I showed this, this Rydberg scheme where you can really engineer strong interactions. And on the bottom, you have this clock state, which is ultra narrow transitions. And one thing we we'll plan to do in the future is really combine them. So you can basically use this Rydberg state to engineer gates on this clock transition. And you can think of entanglement enhanced metrology mediated basically by this Rydberg state. So that's one idea. Okay. So I'll, I'll conclude and, and, and go to a brief outlook. So the summary is that we basically managed to trap these alkaline, sorry, alkaline earth atoms in tweezers and demonstrate a narrow line cooling. And there's parallel uh, efforts in Chiller and Princeton who also showed that. And then we followed uh, up on this with really high fidelity imaging. So these are these four nines upwards uh, fidelity records and also records in lifetime. Um, so this is a short paper we published very shortly afterwards. Uh, we now very recently managed to really do record fidelity, Rydberg, pi pulses, detection and entanglement, also in alkaline earth atoms. And then uh, a paper from, from last year is also this first visa array optical clock, where we really did all the standard clock techniques, where we do two clock comparison, uh, systematic errors on a single tweezer level and all this kind of stuff. Um, and what we really look uh, forward to in the future is we think we really have the coherence times to do quantum simulation between like really beyond numerics uh, with 80 qubits upwards. That's something that we're currently working on. And we'll look into gates and explore ideas for quantum enhanced metrology, for example, together with Monica. Um, so I want to zoom out for the last minute. So I think this is uh, one of the main points. So I, I started with all these different areas and I think I convinced you to a certain degree that this is useful for quantum simulation and metrology. I think you can also do uh, quantum computing. We have some ideas for quantum networks. So uh, one thing I think that we learned is that somewhat this, uh, okay, one, one, one thing that is known is that if you have entanglement and you can control a system very well, it can aid precision measurements. You can build a better clock or detect a signal better. That's one thing that's known. So what we also learned is that if you can do precision measurements, it also aids these other things. So that's one of the things we learned with this alkaline earth atoms. If you can do narrow line cooling, if you have metastable states, and if you have clock techniques. So something I did not talk about. So how do we align Rydberg beams? We align Rydberg beams by looking at shifts on the clock transition to Hertz level. This is how I get a, such a homogeneous system that I get to three, four nines. That's what we use. We, we, we do spectroscopy on, on, on Rydberg states. We two clock comparison now. So we use these techniques in a quantum simulation or quantum computing context. So this is a very uh, fruitful marriage, I believe, for us. And more generally, I think this, this strontium and terbium arrays, it's a unified platform for doing computing and simulation and metrology in the same platform. So what I believe you will see in 10 years is an array of 10,000 atoms or 1,000 atoms where I can do gates and I can run a clock at the same time, a 3D lattice clock. So I can really program entanglement in there and, and make use of this and, and vice versa. And that's some sort of the dream that, that is slowly emerging out of this, out of these ideas. And, and the question is about scalability also. And I think if you really push it, you could go to 10 to the four if you're lucky. And the fidelities we have, you can have three nines or four nines. I think in terms of intrinsic limits, 
that are set by atomic physics. And I think it's very exciting in terms of all these quantum science applications. So there's a lot more to be done. Uh, um, and maybe the conclusion is that these arrays are fun, so it's a new platform and we're really kind of in the early stages like iron trappers were like 15 years or 20 years ago. And it's very promising already, so we can, for quantum science in general. Okay, so this is my conclusion. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you, so uh, do we have questions for Marlon? Yes. Compare these uh, single atom clocks to more conventional yeah. atomic clocks. Yeah. Um, I, I saw that you had some uh, gradient in your yeah, yeah, yeah. frequency yeah, that's uh, right. um, across there. How much does the uh, the tweezer trap affect the clock frequency? You mentioned that there isn't the interaction between atoms, but yeah, that's, the environment. That is a very good question. So in a so I mean that's multiple statements one can make. One is upon systematic effects. I think that's what you're asking is the shifts. Uh, these shifts are kind of introduced almost on purpose, the one that I showed. Uh, this comes from this acousto-optical deflectors, actually. It's kind of crazy. So this acousto-optical deflector uh, changes the frequency of your optical beam by plus minus 30 megahertz. So this is a terahertz, hundreds of terahertz, and we see that shift basically. And that shift comes basically because you change, change it away from a magic wavelength by 10 megahertz and you see it. But there's other trapping techniques where you don't have that. So if you use a specialized modulator, that's gone. Um, I think that's not the point of it. So it's not the point to stay in a tweezer. I think what you really want to do is you want to go back into a lattice. So you, because a lattice is always the cleanest system. So you use these tweezers to put stuff into a lattice. You, you run a clock in a lattice and you use the tweezers for the readout. That's the cleanest clock and you have single atom control at the same time. This gets rid of the systematic effects in terms of stability. Um, we're still a little bit away, uh, but I think this will is a matter of a year or two, and you will see a clock like this with the stability of a lattice clock. Yeah. You just need more atoms and a good laser. I think you will see it. There's no good reason to believe why this shouldn't work. Yeah. It's a good question. What the best clock in 50 years is? I, I would bet some money on something like this. <laughs> yeah? Um, how important is a laser chaos as a source of Laser chaos. You know, like fundamental chaos of chaotic laser oscillation. Okay, so what we know is that one of the fundamental limitations is laser phase noise. And if this is related to chaos, I don't know, probably. I mean, the, this, this system, they just like, the, the frequency of these lasers is not ultimately stable. Uh, and, and over the years, we have become experts in laser phase noise because it matters for clock for sure. I mean, to build a clock that has uh, competitive stability, you need a multi-million dollar laser system and only one person has that at the moment, it's a chiller. <laughs> it's this is, if you want to beat these records, that's the only way to do it. And uh, So it's a face noise question for clocks for sure and then we learned also it's a face noise question for Rydberg, yes. So, so having a good laser is important. I don't know if that's the right answer. <laughs> Yeah, it does actually. It, it does, yeah. So in principle, you, you can't, there's a noise factor in, in, in the stability that you can have if you have systematic effects. And you could correct for that because you know the error signal of each of them. So if it shifted a little bit, you can actually, in the feedback, you, you can do a programmable feedback where you weight the feedbacks and shift them differently. It's an appendix of a paper, but in principle, you can do that. That's right. And you can do clock comparisons between two different sites to see this kind of shifts. That's right. And we also use it, for example, to diagnose. So sometimes you don't know if you actually laser phase noise limited or not. And we did, a, lo we did a, a clock where you can change the number of atoms one by one. I mean, you change it from one to 100 and you look at the scaling, you see standard quantum scaling and on top of a laser. So you can basically, via the technique, isolate the laser frequency noise experimentally. You can do track tricks like that, yes, yeah. Yeah. Is the number of gates I apply, is that limited by the lifetime of the readable atom? Uh, the the yeah, it's essentially this fidelity number that I quoted. Uh, you take that number to the number of n. Uh, there's a loss, but the loss is not limited by the Rydberg lifetime. So I don't think that the Rydberg lifetime is limiting. Uh, the Rydberg lifetime is eventually limiting in how, how good of a gate you can do, but that gate operation, if you just take the Rydberg lifetime and this Rabi frequencies is like this is, uh, five nines or something like this, between four and, nine, four, four and five nines. That's the ultimate limit. Yes, yes. 
It's very high. Yes? The wrong person to ask. If you're trying to figure this out right now, so there's one group who does that in Paris. Um, you need some kind of tunable lens. And you can do it holographically, but not fast enough. So there's a tunable lens. So you could do it in 2D and then, and then move it around. Um, I think the dimension in the third, it's not as large if you just do tweezers. So, so in, in one direction, usually we have 100. You have 100 by 100, and then maybe you have like 10, 20 layers. Well, it's still a lot. I mean, it's like 10,000 times 20. I mean, I don't know. That's not the limitation in the end for me. It's harder to fill them. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think they showed up to 20 or 30 uh, in this direction. They have these nice Eiffel Towers. They're French people. You know, they build Eiffel Towers. Yes. <laughs> Say that. Yeah. Are there questions for Bob? Okay. Thank him again for a moment. Thank you. A bit technical in the middle, maybe. Oh, no.